gorgeous. <whistles> Beautiful. Hey guys, how you doing? What's happening? What it's like? You like that, huh? What I was saying? Yeah, I'm just saying. I'm just one gorgeous Caesarian beast. Arr! Emphasis on beast. No, but honestly, I do truly, truly cherish your prayers. Keep praying. I know you do because you love Jesus Christ and you love me for his sake. Don't stop praying for my daughters and I. Ask the Lord Jesus to help me continue the path of losing more weight. I've lost a lot by his grace. And glory to Jesus, I haven't gained any back. Pray I don't gain it back, but I continue to lose, lose the rest of it so I can get healthier, be more disciplined <clears throat> physically and spiritually. And ask the Lord Jesus to help me to be holier, which is more important, to be more holy, more pure, more worshipful, more obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that the Lord Jesus Jesus will always bless my daughters, that they will be healthier than me and outlive me if the Lord Jesus tarries, right? So I appreciate your prayers for me. You know, I do. I really do. Your prayers are, how do I say this? Your prayers are more important, and so I don't want to say this to come off as, as um, saying that your financial contribution is not important. It definitely is important. But your prayers are more important because your prayers <clears throat> will be used by God to bring about his will in my life and in your life. And God is a God of infinite riches. Our Father is infinitely rich, and he loves us more than we can imagine. And he is the one who stirs up hearts of his children to support one another for the glory of Jesus Christ. So I truly cherish your prayers and your fasting for my family. And I do want to say there have been some new Patreon supporters. Some people have joined <clears throat> in helping me financially to do full-time ministry. You know who you are. There are plenty of you. Please forgive me if I have not reached out to you personally. It's not because I don't care for you. I see, <clears throat> Lord Jesus willing, I would like to reach out to every one of you in due course and just send you an email thanking you. If I haven't done that, it's not because you're being ignored. The Lord Jesus sees your love and your contribution, and I beseech my Lord Jesus, my God and Savior, to bless you richly for partnering with me financially to do this work for the glory of Jesus Christ because you don't need to be supporting me. You could be supporting someone else. The fact you do blesses me. So thank you guys. You know who you are. May the Lord Jesus who loves you bless you <clears throat> for not only coming alongside of me, praying for me and fasting for me and my daughters, but contributing financially. God bless you guys. You know who you are. And pretty much I can't do much for you guys. Jesus does everything for us. It is Jesus who does everything for us to bring us closer to him, to love him, to trust him. Even me here, even me here teaching, that's because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything good, let me re remind you of this. As the Holy Spirit protects me from error and anoints my mouth and my tongue to speak truth for the glory of Jesus and sanctify me. Holy Spirit, save me from error to bless your people, the children of the living God, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Anything good and everything good is from God. Even teachers that you listen to that are being used of the Holy Spirit to bless you, to grow stronger in your faith, to fall more in love with Jesus, to understand the scriptures with greater depth, that's because of Jesus. That's why I'm saying everything good, even if this is good and approved by the Spirit, that's the Lord Jesus. We can't do anything for you. It is the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who does everything for the church. Everything for creation necessary for them to know that he lives and he loves them and wants them to turn to the true God to be saved. Even the blessing of YouTube, even the blessing of social media, internet, all of these are the graces of the triune God, the graces of the Father, the Lord Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that he uses to bring us closer to him. 
So that's why I said, I can't do anything for you because unless the Lord Jesus had put it in my heart to teach, I wouldn't be here. The fact that I'm here teaching, that's because the Holy Spirit sets people apart. And he says, you, you're going to do this for the kingdom of Christ and for building up his church on earth. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. That's the Holy Spirit, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They alone get all glory for everything good that we experience and receive and enjoy. So remember that, right? Just keep that in mind, right? So you guys with me, right? What's up, my man? Nikki, that's a compliment. You know I love Bruce. Even the fact, even the fact that I'm such a gorgeous, handsome, bald Assyrian, that too is the work of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Can't you tell I'm humble? No, but all joking aside, yeah, no, humble. All joking aside, honestly, I hope it's not just me, but I'm, I'm honest. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Man, I cannot stand my voice or the way I look. I really can't, right? You know, so when I talk about me being good looking, I, you know, I'm kidding with you. Honestly, man, when I look in the mirror or when I'm seeing like right now, I'm in the live stream so I can pay attention to the comments. I'm looking at myself I'm like, oh, my goodness. Why couldn't my father be Arnold Schwarzenegger and my mother be Kim Kardashian so I could have the best set of genetics and be drop-dead gorgeous? Instead, my poor father was a bald guy. When he was young, he was very handsome, young and dapper. But as he got older, and I'm the last of six, so, you know, my luck he had me when he was old and had a belly and he was bald and wearing glasses. And my mother, she was pretty, she was a beautiful woman when she was younger. So, but can you imagine if Arnold Schwarzenegger and Kim Kardashian were my parents? Yeah, I'd be back, baby. Yeah, let's turn to Genesis 126. Hey, Killian, it's in Mark. Killian. Yeah, I, listen, when I say Kim Kardashian, just by way of confession, I think that family is a disgrace to women and promote immorality and filth. And may God grant them repentance. May God convict them and chasten them to repent because they are a disgrace to women. They objectify women and they give women a bad name because <clears throat> when you look at them, you don't view them with respect you see them as meat and that's disrespectful despicable and dishonoring to women to portray yourselves as sex objects so that you justify that women are nothing but meat for men to devour it's disgusting so when i say that don't think i'm but i will say by way of confession by way of confession by i will say if you ask me what is the ideal looking woman for me Kim Kardashian. Sorry, I'm just I'm telling you. Far as what I like in looks, in fact, here let me let me confess something else to you guys. To me, the most beautiful woman to me, apart from my Assyrian sisters, I don't want my Assyrian sisters to get angry. I've always been fascinated by Hispanic women and African American women, or African women because you have. I don't want to say black women because. You got to be politically correct, Sam. You can't say black anymore. You have to say Caucasian, African, Asian. All right? Now I'm talking about before her surgery, right? Yeah, I've always found, okay, is that more appropriate to say colored woman? Hispanic women, I've always, like, wow, right, Lord? But it wasn't God's will for me to marry either Hispanic woman or a colored woman. Yeah, Monica Bellucci, forget. Yes, Gabriel, that's exactly it, Monica Bellucci. So if you ask me, Sam, what is your preference of woman? Monica Bellucci, she'll make me sing Italian. She'll make me start singing Italian. I pray that Connie is on fire for Jesus, sold out for Jesus, and God uses him to lead people to saving faith. Hey, that was pretty good. You got to admit, right? 
Was that pretty good or what? Okay. You want me to do that again? Guys, I have a lot of articles I got to share before we begin. So I need to share articles and then I'm going to begin in prayer. No, Louisa, I'm talking about Kim Kardashian before plastic, not now. She's like a Barbie doll. I'm talking about pre-plastic days, right? But like I said, Hispanic and colored women, you know, I've always thought they were beautiful. That doesn't mean other nationalities are beautiful. Even my Assyrian sisters, a lot of them are beautiful. God bless you, Sherba. Lord bless you. In fact, Sherba, you're named after one of these saints, right? You want me to do it again? You want me to do the opera voice again? So I said, he mentioned Monica Bellucci, and it doesn't help that she played Mary Magdalene in The Passion of the Christ. Mel Gibson had to, had to have her play Mary Magdalene. Right. Uh, guys, I have about maybe eight, nine articles I have to share with you before we begin. So we're so just waiting for a few minutes, hopefully by the grace of God. The modem will warm up, and we don't buffer in Jesus' name. See, now, Magdalene G., she's not African-American. She's African-British. Is that right? You're African-British? It's tea time, sister. Okay, let me do that again. Amen. Thank you, Navy, for that prayer. I praise Jesus. He saved me too. Come on. Was that good? Was that good? Come on. Man. I just don't know the words. Honestly, don't, don't pull my leg. Was that good? Good looking, I'm not. My voice is, is terrible, but at least when I'm singing. Is it, oh, Santa Lucia? I got to remember the words. I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll I'll memorize the words of the song and then I'll sing Santa Lucia. All right. Yeah, Pedro, don't be lying, bro. Okay, you're my essay, homie. Hey, Pedro. Instead of being my essay, why don't you be my paragraph? Okay, carnal. You would know, huh, Sahi Christian? You would know, huh, Juani? All right. Guys, are you ready now for the links to the article so we can begin? And God willing. After this session, Lord Jesus willing, 8 p.m. New York time, my brother in Christ, the theological beast, Anthony Rogers, will be debating the same Unitarian heretic, Andrew Griffin, on David Wood's channel. So you're in for a treat this Resurrection Weekend. What a way to usher in Resurrection Sunday for the glory of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. After this, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Anthony Rogers, a Trinitarian theological beast, and even looks like a beast. Well, thank God salvation is not dependent on looks because that man would be in the lowest pit of... No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, he's going to be debating Andrew Griffin on the same topic. Does the Gospel of John teach the deity of Jesus Christ? Right? So after this, to win it, I'm going to be listening to Anthony Rogers going, School him, son. Same guy. Now that tells you he's not repenting, right? The same gentleman that we've been praying for salvation, Andrew Griffin, we had two talks with him, even though he got schooled, he still wants to prove that John's gospel does not teach the deity of Christ. And now he wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a theological giant, theological giant, Anthony Rogers. Okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't hear what Magdalene said. Magdalene, did you say you were African British? Am I right? Your roots are from Africa, from the motherland? My Nubian queen, my Nubian princess. All right, now you ready for the articles? Liza J is in the hizzy. Liza J is in the hizzy. She comes when she wants. She leaves when she wants because this is her world, and I'm just a squirrel. She comes when she wants. She leaves when she wants. No one can tell Liza what to do. It's all about you. All right, you ready? Are you ready for the articles? A lot of articles. This is part two of a multi-part series. So the links to part one and three will be there. 
This is on Abraham and Isaac being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abraham and Isaac being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. So link for link number one. I just posted it twice. Oh, my goodness. So you are an African too, Pedro. So you can't be my essay, nor can you be my paragraph. Carnal, you're not my mijo. Que carnal? That's one. Did you get that link? Click on the link. Save these articles. We're quarantined. You got nothing but time to read. I promise you, by the grace of Jesus Christ, these articles have meat. Meat. Study them. Absorb them. And pass them on to others. So that's one. Now here starts. Let me start posting a lot. There's a lot. I'm gonna put. Uh, I'm gonna just post them once. Here's the second article. Here's the second article. That's the second article. Okay. So save them, please. Click on the links and save them. Lord willing, later we'll try to put them in the description box. Thank the the mods praise the lord jesus christ for the mods for helping me to help you because they do this free of charge here's now the third article guys third article god bless you Sharbat. third article are you ready you already posted them all okay so you're posting as i'm all oh, giving them to you okay man prot man you are a beast bro see protestant believer is a beast and he looks like one i'm sorry i mean no i mean you know Here's the fourth article. Fourth article. You're, um, you're counting? This is the fourth one. Yeah, this is the fourth one. Almost done. It's all about Jesus being our sacrificial lamb and how the Old Testament prophets prophesied the sufferings, death, resurrection, and glorification of the Messiah, who is our Lord Jesus Christ. So that was the fourth article. Okay, here's the fifth article. Is Syrian in the hizzy? Here's the fifth article. All right, a lot of articles. One thing I do take solace in, I'm better looking than Sai Christian. Okay, this is the sixth article. Article number six. Article number six. Article number six. I told you I got too many articles on too many subjects, but you guys are haters. You don't like to read. And I believe this is now the final article. Article number seven. Click on them. Save them. Read them. I promise you, you will be blessed and enriched by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll have a greater understanding of Scripture and a greater awe of Scripture and greater love for Scripture. The Bible is truly miraculous, supernatural. It truly is the word of the true God. Even a blind man can see that. Okay, here it is. That's the seventh article, and I think it's the final one. Yep, that's the final one. Yeah! Say hello to my little friend. Say hello, man. You know why? Say hello. Hold on. Sorry, let me just tell this guy. Sorry about that. All right. Say hello to my little friend. Right? I'll never turn you, Frank. I met what I could on the side, but I loyal to you, Frank. Does anyone remember what movie that is? Yeah. May the Lord Jesus perfect my sight spiritually and physically. Does anyone remember? Because we're going to begin in prayer. God blessed us yesterday. We had over 250. Glory to the triune God. I keep praying that the Lord will keep bringing more people so this channel goes viral. So subscribe, hit the like button, and pass it on. And it's not because I want numbers for the sake of numbers. May God purify my heart. I want more people to come and learn, provided the Holy Spirit is using me to glorify Jesus Christ. If this work is of the Spirit, I want more people to learn, right? Muhammad Sadi Malcolm. Uh, I, I challenge another Muhammad and call me, but he's too scared to call. Hold on, let's see. Let's see if you're going to call. All right. 
With that said, we're going to begin in prayer by the grace of God. We're going to begin in prayer by the grace of God, and then we're going to start. There's a lot of meat today to cover, and so God willing, thank you, Basirat. No, it's not, Basirat, no. Keep pleading the blood of Jesus, that's what I do. Because what you're doing is you're asking the Lord Jesus to wash them, purify them, sanctify them, and shield him, shield them by his sufferings, his passion, and his resurrection life. So no, there's nothing wrong with it. Don't let anyone tell you there's something wrong with it, okay? Basirat, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. So Father, we love you, and we need to always remind ourselves that we need to love you and praise you and thank you, and then truly show that we love you by obedience to you and the power of your Holy Spirit, life from your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we love you. You are alive. You are risen. You are life. And you can never die, never again. You are truly the God-man, the heart of the Father and the Spirit that became flesh. Holy Spirit, we love you. So, Holy Spirit, please, I ask you, as you blessed last night, bless today. Sanctify me and save me from error and stammering and confusion, Holy Spirit. Empower me to recall these passages perfectly. Perfect that ability in me for the glory of Jesus. Not to bring attention to myself, but to bring it to the Lord Jesus by your power, Holy Spirit. And purify my motives to do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Enable me and interpret the passages correctly and bless everyone here, Holy Spirit, with insight from your presence, with wisdom and knowledge, understanding, and give us the power, every one of us, to then live out the truth that you're making known to us, to live out the Bible, live it out, proclaim it, share it, defend it, and even be willing to die for the Bible because that is the voice of our God, your voice, Holy Spirit, your voice, Lord Jesus, your voice, Holy Father to your people, to your church, to your flock. Destroy all distractions of Satan. Fill my chest, my lungs, and my throat with the breath of life, the health I need to do this, Lord. As long as you want me to teach and keep me on this earth, even though it's much better to be in your presence, truly it is. And destroy our fears and doubts and unbelief, to have no doubt there is life with you beyond the grave. But if you want me to remain, Father, Lord Jesus, if you want me to remain, Holy Spirit, if you want me to remain, to glorify Jesus, your will be done. Give me the holiness I, I need to keep pure and save me from my passions. Save us from our sinful passions. To truly be pure and save us, please, from our own sinfulness. To delight your heart, Father. To delight your heart, Lord Jesus. To delight your heart, O sweet, beautiful Spirit of the Father and the Son. And grant me the health I need to do this. And Lord, please bless them to understand what they're hearing. Bless our loved ones. And Holy Spirit, you know, in my life, who I constantly ask you to bless, my angels, my daughters, another Sunday, another Easter without their earthly father, but they have their heavenly father. They have Jesus and they have you. Do a resurrection and bring them to me and bless them and remind them their earthly Baba loves them more than they can imagine. Bless them, Holy Spirit. Bless our loved ones, Holy Spirit. Bless us and be with us and comfort us. Remind me, Holy Spirit, that I do not exist. None of us exist for this life, for these worldly pleasures or pursuits. None of us exist even for our children or our parents or our spouses. We exist for God and our true meaning is found in worshiping our God. And we must love him more than anything. Give us the grace and the power to do that. We thank you. Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Take over the session, please. In Jesus' name. Yahovah, amen. Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Somebody's texting me again. See, always distractions. Distractions and distractions of the evil one. Okay. Everyone ready? God bless you, Johnny Torch. God bless you for your support. Do covenant with me to pray and fast for my daughters and I. God bless you, Mr. Phil. Okay, I will do a Hulk impersonation before I'm done. Mr. Phil, let my voice warm up because I'm not a young man anymore. I used to be able to speak 10 hours a day. Right now I do one two-hour session and my voice wants to give out. 
So if the Lord Jesus is pleased, I pray that my sight doesn't give out or my voice, that I can use my sight to continue to read his word and my voice to glorify him, that those are the last things to go. So I'll do it before I end, okay, Phil? Remind me, though. Remind me. Now, that said, I want to talk about, because this came up, I don't know if you guys got to watch the live stream that I did with Al Fadi on Facebook. <clears throat> Al Fadi asked some excellent questions concerning the death of our Lord Jesus and the resurrection. If you haven't, go to his Facebook page. He did a Facebook live stream. It's archived, and I shared it on my social media pages, on my Facebook pages. So listen to it. So there is one thing I do want to mention. Only some of it, Magdalene. Only some of it. I bet you if it was David Wood, you would have listened to all of it, right? See how you are, sister? Even though you said you're African-British, you still prefer the white man over the Assyrian, Middle Eastern, Mediter Mediterranean man. Why is that, sister? Do you know we Mediterraneans, we Middle Easterns are closer to Africa than the white man? And the white man, he is known to be a thorn in the side of all colored people because I'm a colored man. I am olive skin. Technically, I'm not Caucasian. The white man exists to destroy ethnicities, to cause ethnic groups to fight each other. So as we slaughter each other, the white man takes over. And David Wood is proof of that. Because he's white, he is <clears throat> subtly doing things behind the scenes to destroy YouTube ministry so that he can monopolize YouTube and then we're at his mercy and we can only post what he wants us to post if we're going to succeed. So, sister, why are you helping the white man? Why are you helping whitey? Why are you helping the white man? Love who you are, my Nubian princess. Sorry. <laughs> you know I got mental issues, right? Guys, honestly, I got mental issues. I got psychological, emotional issues. As David Wood, the great white dope, I mean great white hope says, I'm like the rain man of Christianity, right? My grandma and your grandma sitting by the fire. My grandma said to your grandma, I'm going to put your house on fire. Talk about hey na, hey na, waka waka wa -e. Do you guys remember that song? That was in the movie, Rain Man. Thank you, Mr. Phil. Well, I hope it's it's tears of joy, Mr. Phil. I hope it's tears of joy. Okay. Now, let me mention where our Lord, where was our Lord for those three days that his physical body lay in the tomb? This is an ancient tradition of the church. In fact, I would dare say, and I, here's where I want you to pay attention, because I believe it's biblical. Right? I believe the Bible teaches it, which is why the early church affirmed it. You'll find it in the creeds, the affirmation and the belief, right? And I dare say this was the unanimous belief of the church. Amen. The Christians, as far back as you can go, as far as the extent writings we have show, the extent writings, because we don't have all the writings of the church fathers, but what we do have, we see as far as back as you can go, even... <clears throat> from the writings of Irenaeus and others, you'll find the belief that when our Lord Jesus died physically, he was still alive by virtue of being God, but also, don't forget, and I want you to remember this, we don't believe the Bible teaches soul sleep, that when you die, you go into a sleep, you're not conscious. Our belief is, and it's the belief of the ancient church, because it's biblical, even though there are groups out there, they'll challenge me, like seven-day Adventists. Our belief is that when a person physically dies, that's because his human spirit, his human soul leaves his or her body. And you are still consciously alive. You're still conscious. You're still alive. You still have awareness when your body returns to the dust. So you continue to exist as what we call, it's a technical term, disembodied spirits, disembodied souls, meaning souls and spirits without a physical body. So please pay attention because I want you to learn this. It's biblical. Not only do you continue to exist as disembodied spirits, souls, but your soul, your spirit, we're just beginning, Azul. 
your soul, your spirit has a shape, a form of some kind by which you're identifiable. Are you with me there? So when you die physically, your spirit leaves your body. And if you're a believer, you enter God's heavenly presence where the angels are, where Christ is dwelling in his physical glorified body and where other believers are dwelling without physical bodies, what we call disembodied, without the body, souls and spirits. But even as a soul, as a spirit, you have a shape, you have a form by which you are identifiable, by which someone will recognize you and know it's you. No, Gabriel, that's unbiblical teaching. You've been influenced by Seventh-day Adventists. That is not a biblical teaching. I've done a teaching on, on this, but again, I want you to know that's not a biblical teaching. Contrary to what a Seventh-day Adventist may say, it's not soul sleep. Now, if someone believes in soul sleep, but is a diehard Trinitarian and believes in the Bible, that doesn't mean they're, they're not saved. It means it is a false teaching, but it's not one that will damn you. So let me be clear. Let me repeat. There are some doctrines that can damn you if you reject them. But there are other doctrines that you may have a different opinion, and you may be wrong, but still under the mercy of Jesus Christ. Right? Is that making sense before I move on? And you know what's amazing? Did you know that medical science, the medical field, confirms this biblical truth? What the Bible has taught and what Christians throughout the centuries have always believed and other traditions have believed, medical science is now confirming it. And it's not religious doctors. These are people who may be agnostic, maybe even atheists, maybe even Hindus or Muslims. But now in the medical field, there were two studies done, one from Germany. And you can do a search on this. Don't take my word for it. Go on YouTube or go Sheikh Google, the greatest religious scholar mankind has ever known. Sheikh Google. Sheikh Google. Rabbi Google. The greatest religious scholars ever existed. Two studies came out saying that consciousness is separate from brain activity. And they concluded that when a person dies, the brain dies, the heart stops, they continue to experience consciousness apart from brain activity. And they base this on what they call out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences. So even medical science is confirming what the Bible has taught and what Christians have always believed. Yep. Near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, are not simply hallucinations of the mind. There are studies done showing it's not the brain firing neurons, creating an illusion. That's been debunked, right? So this is another field confirming what the Bible has always taught. Alex, which part of Sheikh Google wasn't clear? Do go to Sheikh Google, Rabbi Google, Rabban Google, and put in Germany, Medical study, out-of-body experience, near-death experience. And you'll see it. I have a book on it. It's in my, it's in one of my boxes. I won't be able to find it. I found a book and I read it. Yep, Imam Google. Now, with that said, the Bible teaching is clear. And I need you to listen to this because I'm going to show you what our, where, where our Lord went for those three days that his body was in the tomb. The Bible teaching is clear if you let the Bible speak and not impose your tradition on it. When a man or a woman dies physically, their spirit, their soul leaves their body. And if you're a believer, now after Christ, after Jesus' resurrection, ascension to heaven, the believer enters God's heavenly presence as a disembodied spirit. But your spirit, your soul still has a shape, a form by which you are identifiable so that if I enter glory now, I will see my mother. And I know it's my mother. I'll see my father, and it's my father. I'll recognize it's Paul, and it's Peter, even though it's not a physical body. Yep, Gary Habermas. Let me recommend one of the leading experts on near-death experience, out-of-body experience, and he's an evangelical Trinitarian and one of the greatest scholars on the historical evidence for the resurrection. Gary Habermas. Gary Habermas. 
right? He's an expert on it. So now with that said, with that said, where did our Lord Jesus Christ go when he died physically? Let me prove that when Jesus died, he was still alive. He was still conscious. He was still aware. He had awareness, consciousness. He didn't go to sleep. He wasn't unconscious, quote unquote. Go to John 2, 19 to 22. John 2, 19 to 22. Yeah, Remy, it's not that we believe all these stories. It's simply data from the secular field by unbelieving <clears throat> doctors and scientists that are confirming what the Bible's always taught. Consciousness exists apart from the brain. When the body's dead, the brain is dead and the heart is dead. Stops beating. John 2, 19 to 22. Because Satan can also cause someone whose spirit leaves their body to see something to deceive them even in that state. But that's another topic. Let's focus. John 2, 19 to 22. Yep, he is the bomb. Gary Habermas is the bomb. Now, here is proof that when Jesus physically died, he was still alive, he was still conscious, and he was still sustaining creation as God. And J.P. Moreland is another renowned evangelical philosopher who defends the existence of the soul, refuting materialism or physicality. We're not merely physical beings. Anyway, let's focus, guys, because you guys are now getting me excited by mentioning these outstanding men of God. Outstanding men of God that I cannot hold a candlestick to. You know, they put it this way. When you mention them, I feel about them what Sai Christian feels about me. Because when Sai Christian looks at me, he feels insignificant. He feels insecure because he's like, look at this man. What a gorgeous beast of humanity, hunk of humanity. And he's a genius. And in his presence, I realize I'm nothing. See, that's how I feel when you mention these names. The same way Sai Christian feels in my presence. It's okay, Sai Christian. We still love you, but not that much. Okay, John 2, 19 to 22. Keep being confused about the spirit and the soul, Snow Leopard, because it's not the time to discuss if they're different. All right? John 2, 19 and 22. Let's read. Jesus answered, sent unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Who will raise it up? He will. I personally will raise it up. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear, rear it up in three days? This old English kills my lisp and kills my tongue. Whew. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? Will you raise it up? You will raise up the temple that we destroy in three days? Now, what temple was he talking about? Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou, you, rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered they, that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now, did you catch it? Jesus says, destroy my body, and I will raise up my body in three days. Can I ask you guys a question? How can Jesus personally resurrect his body to immortality if he was unconscious, if he ceased to be conscious when he physically died? When he physically died. Because physical, that doesn't mean you become unconscious, quote unquote. You cease to be conscious. You lose consciousness. Physical death is when your soul and spirit leave your body and enter into another dimension. So with that said, when our Lord Jesus died, where did his human spirit, his human soul go to for those three days? Now pay attention here. I've already demonstrated this, and I've talked about this in previous sessions. And one session I did on the communion of the saints. I did a multi-part series on the communion of the saints, and I brought up the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Go back, re-listen to those sessions, because I'm just going to summarize here. I don't have time to unpack. I'm going to summarize here. Okay, pay attention to this, because I really need you to get this for the glory of Jesus, not because I want you to pay attention to me. 
I want you to pay attention to the word of God. Okay. Up until Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, no one entered into God's heavenly presence. When the dead died, the righteous and the evil alike went to the abode called Sheol, Sheol in Greek, Hades, Hades. But here's the catcher. And this is all demonstrated in Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. Go listen to my multi-part series and listen to my talk that I did to a sister who was dying of cancer, Josie. I did a two-part, well, I did a I did one talk that was broken down into two parts where I was comforting her where she was going to go when she died because she's a believer in Jesus Christ. And shortly after that talk, she passed away. She entered the presence of the Lord Jesus. So go listen to the evidence because here I'm only summing up. I'm only summing up. Okay. I can't go in depth right now because then I'll go off topic. During that time leading to Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, up until that point, believers, unbelievers alike, went to the same dimension called Sheol, Hades, Hades. But there was two sections, two compartments, so to speak. There was a section in which unbelievers went to be tormented, experienced agony and pain and misery. But there was another section, another compartment in the same dimension where believers went and they were in a state of peace, state of bliss, state of joy, and they didn't experience pain, misery, or discomfort. And you find this articulated in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Let's look at it real quickly. And by parable, I don't mean it's not true because parables are based on Actual, everyday phenomena, everyday, actual, real-life experiences, right? So let's go to Luke 16. Let's read 22 to 26 real quickly. <laughs> real quickly. Yes, but there are two paradises according to Jewish understanding. There was the paradise of Sheol where the believers went in peace and bliss, and there was the paradise of God, where God dwelt with angels, and they saw his visible glory. Okay, now read with me, guys. Please do read with me, because I want to make a point. I want to make a point. Luke 16, 22 to 26. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Pay attention. They both died. The poor man, the beggar, was taken to the bosom of Abraham to be in the company of Abraham, his father. And in hell, now in the Greek, the word is Hades, Hades. And in hell, in Hades, the rich man died and was buried. In hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw, even though he's in torment, he saw Abraham afar off at a distance, but he could still see him and recognize him. And Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime. Remember when you were living on earth. Receivest thy good things. You lived lavishly. You enjoyed life on earth. And likewise, Lazarus suffered. He experienced evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. See, he's in comfort with me. Where we're at, we're in comfort and rest and peace. You over there, though we see you, you're in torment. But now notice 26. Notice 26. <clears throat> and beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed. So that, that they which would pass from hence... To you cannot. So we can't go to where you're at, though we see each other. We're in the same dimension. Neither can they pass to us that you would come from thence. Notice they're in the same dimension. 
But notice there are two compartments and there's a gulf where one can't cross over to the other. You guys see that? Okay, now here's a question for you. It says, the rich man saw afar off at a great distance Abraham and saw Lazarus. And he knew it was Abraham and he knew it was Lazarus. And he said, Father Abraham. So he recognized him. That's Father Abraham, my father Abraham. That means the rich man was an ethnic Jew. He was ethnically a Jew because he calls Abraham his father. So that means Abraham was his physical ancestor. Father Abraham. And he goes, tell Lazarus to do this for me. Can I ask you guys a question? Here's my question for all of you. Neither Abraham nor Lazarus nor the rich man were in physical bodies. How did the rich man know this man here that's standing, that's Abraham, and there's another man next to him, that's Lazarus. How could he recognize them and realize they're not the same person when they don't have physical bodies? Yep, Jake, you got it. Snow, no answer it. Because they had a spiritual shape, a spiritual body of some kind by which they could be identified. You get it now? And that should cause you great hope and joy that if you're a Christian, because the physical death is not the end of you, saint. Physically, when you die, your spirit leaves and your spirit has a shape and a form by which the inhabitants of heaven will recognize you and you're going to recognize them. And you're going to see your loved ones alive, conscious, in peace, pain-free, cancer-free, disease-free. That's the assurance that Jesus' resurrection gives us. This is the assurance that Jesus' resurrection gives us. Jake, don't misapply 1 Corinthians 15, 44. That spiritual body is not referring to what happens to you when you die. It's talking about your physical body being glorified and or resurrected. So don't apply 1 Corinthians 15, 44 to this talk. It's different. You're going to confuse yourself. Jake, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 has nothing to do with the kind of body and shape you have when you die. You're confusing 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm trying to help you. Don't get confused. 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about your physical body being transformed and or raised immortal. Different context, different body. Don't confuse yourself. Are you with me there? Because I don't have time to unpack it now. You're misapplying 1 Corinthians 15, 44 to the kind of shape and form that those who physically die have by which they are identifiable. When you die, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 is not about the type of appearance you have. It's not talking about someone who dies. What kind of form and appearance will he have in heaven? If you read the context, it's talking about the resurrected body and those who are alive on earth who don't die. What happens to them if Jesus comes down upon them? He transforms them while they're alive in their physical bodies on earth into a body that's glorious and immortal and imperishable. I don't want you to confuse yourself. How would I, why would you want me to explain Acts 2, 31, 32? What's the point? Now follow with me here. Follow with me so far. Are you seeing that the rich man recognizes Abraham Lazarus? That means even without a physical body, as spirits, as souls, their spirits and souls have a form and appearance, a shape by which they are still identifiable. With me there? With me there before I move on to the next point? Let me give you further proof from Luke 16, 22 to 23. Let's relook at Luke 16, 22 to 23. So I can make the point about Jesus, because we're going to go to Jesus and we're going to go to Abraham. Luke 16, 22 to 23. Okay. Pay attention, guys. It's not enough that we read. We want to read with understanding to get the meat of Scripture. Notice what it said here. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. First question. 
What were they carrying? Not his body. It said he died. But the angels carried him. What were they carrying to Abraham? The angels carried him. Yes. Wait, so he has a shade, a soul, a spirit that can be carried? So though it's a spirit, it's still tangible enough that you can carry it, you can touch it, you can embrace it, you can be held by it? You catch it now? But then 22, 23 stated, the rich man died and was buried. But then in 23 it says, he found himself in Hades in torment. But wait, he's buried. So which part of him was in Hades in, in torment? But it says the rich man died and was buried. So they buried his body, but then he found himself in torment in flames in Hades. What part was buried? What part was in Hades? What part of the rich man was buried? What part of him was in Hades? So what part was in what part was buried? What part was buried? Oh, so what part of him was in Hades? His soul. So are you getting it now? Is it making sense now? If you believe in the Bible and let the Bible interpret itself and don't impose a tradition by some denomination that doesn't allow you to accept what the Bible teaches about the state of the dead, then the Bible does not teach soul sleep. It's not biblical. And those who say it does explain all these passages away. Oh, that's a parable. Oh, but this doesn't mean that. And that doesn't mean this. They have to explain it away. Pedro, he knew he's not getting out. He knew he deserved where he went. He knew. There was no getting out for him. He knew his fate. He knew this was the just judgment that fell upon him. But anyway, but let's not worry about the mental state of the rich man because you're more interested about his mental state. You're kind of scaring me. When you go there and see him, ask him. Okay, Pedro, when you get there and see him, you can ask him. See, you guys didn't catch it, did you? <laughs> Jake got it. LOL. <laughs> Jake got it. God forbid, Pedro, you end up there. What do you mean, okay? What's wrong with you, dude? If you end up seeing him and asking him, that means you're going to be in him, with him in the torment. Hello, Pedro. Hello, carnal. Hello. Hello, S.A. All right. Okay, if we got that now, let's talk about where Jesus went. Where did our Lord go for those three days that his body lay in the tomb? The ancient tradition of the church, and you'll find documents from at least the second century affirming it, and it's mentioned in the creeds. And I dare say this was the unanimous belief of the church. In other words, I'm not aware, and I'm no scholar of church history, and if you know of any contrary evidence, please bring it to my attention. I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me into all truth, to guide all of us into all truth and save us from error. I'm not aware of any descending, dissenting opinion. I'm not aware of anyone in the early church not believing this. So what did the early church believe? That the three days that our Lord's body lay in the tomb, his human spirit, his human soul went to Hades, Hades, which in some English translations they render as hell. And I'll even prove it to you. I'm going to recite the following, the Apostles' Creed. I'm going to recite the Apostles' Creed, and you'll find elements of the Apostles' Creed in the writing of the church father Irenaeus. Irenaeus was the bishop of Lyons, France. He's writing around 180 AD. And he mentions traditions that they received from the apostles. And Irenaeus was a martyr of the faith. He died as a martyr for Jesus. And he was a disciple of the bishop Polycarp. Follow with me. Irenaeus, disciple of the bishop Polycarp, 
Polycarp was the disciple of the Apostle John. So Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp, who was taught by the Apostle of John. You with me there? Are you with me there? Why Irenaeus is an important witness. And Irenaeus mentions that when he was young, he recalls seeing the Apostle John. So we have this unbroken chain. Irenaeus, taught by Polycarp, taught by the Apostle John. Now, elements of this creed you'll find stated in Irenaeus. Now, you can go to Sheikh Google, put Irenaeus Apostles' Creed, and should come up. Let me recite the Apostles' Creed. Let's see if you catch it. Are you ready? I'm going to recite it. No, not, not 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22, Manny. Brother, help me to help you by not helping me. 1 Peter 3, 18 and 22 is not one of those passages you use to show that Jesus went to 80s. It's complicated. That's why I want you to help me to help you. Don't quote verses that you think support your position, which then will entail that I have to explain there's more than one interpretation. I'm going to give you the passages that clearly teach, that clearly say Jesus went to the netherworld, right? I'm trying to give you the most solid exegetical proofs, the most solid ones, not ones that are open to interpretation, Yes, Bible care. When Jesus relinquished his spirit and he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When Jesus' spirit left his body, when he says, into your hands, he, he means that I entrust my fate in your hands. It doesn't mean my spirit returns to the Father in heaven, my human spirit. Don't get me wrong. My human spirit returns to the Father. It means I entrust my fate into your hands. And so what did the father decree for the son? That the son's human spirit, as a human spirit, a human soul, would go into the netherworld. So yes, Bible care. When Jesus' human spirit left his body and he died on the cross, his human spirit would have then entered into the netherworld. Are you with me there, Bible care? Making sense? Before I move on? Making sense? Gabriel. Allahu Akbar, Gabriel Espinoza. Allah, I, I feel like I need to pray for you to return to heaven. What happened to something called patience, Gabriel? Can you be patient or you want me to just rush into this and confuse you more? Gabriel, can I pay for your schooling to go and become a medical doctor, Gabriel Espinoza? I want you to be a doctor. You know why? Because my prayer is that when you become a doctor, you'll have... Many and much patience. <laughs> okay, anyway. Okay. Is it making sense? Guys, if you just be patient a little bit, I promise you. Trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me. If you just be patient, I'll get to these questions that you're already asking me. Let me get there. You're like, Sam, just skip everything and just get to the point. All right, Jesus went to Hades, preached. Okay, guys, over, let's go. Okay, next subject. Dude, my goodness, what has modern technology done to you guys, man? Just like you want fast food, you want fast apologetics. One-minute apologetics. We don't have patience anymore. If it's more than 10 minutes, ah, uh, you zone me out. Let me go play some more video games. Dude, relax, breathe. Melo, Logos, my goodness, dude. You can have fast food, but you can't have fast apologetics. Because if I rush through this, then you're going to be dumb as an ox. You're going to be like David Wood, a mentally challenged, half-baked, white dope, white dictator apologist. Do you want to be like him or do you want to be great? Darn it, man. Shit. Okay, now let's come back. Let's focus by the grace of Jesus Christ. Okay. Let me recite, which I've been trying to recite for the past 10 minutes, the Apostles' Creed. Can I recite it? Switzerland, let's be neutral. Time out. Jesus Christ is the Lord. How can the human spirit be separated from the divine essence if God by nature is omnipresent. See, this is why I say be patient. You're not. So you just asked him a question. Now I'm going to have to delay the Apostles' Creed. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Do you know that God is omnipresent, meaning the entire creation is present before him? So that means God is also in hell. He's also in Hades. He's also in heaven. He's also on earth. So why would you ask me if the human spirit of Jesus separated from the divine essence when that person of Christ is eternally divine and that human spirit is attached to him so that human spirit, where he goes, that divine essence can't be separated from him spatially because the divine essence is not spatial. Did you hear that? What Pedro just told you, Jesus Christ, Lord? Brah, be patient. Ese. All right. With me there now? So can I now recite the Apostles' Creed? What was the point of reciting the Apostles' Creed? I'm not aware of any dissenting voices in church history, at least from the second century up until the Reformation, where you'll find any bona fide Christian, scholar, theologian, bishop, priest, elder, martyr, denying that Jesus went into the realm of the dead when he physical, physically died, that his human spirit slash soul went there for three days. And this is seen, this is seen in even the creed, such as the Apostles' Creed. Let me let me recite it. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are we ready now? Okay. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, the only begotten Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. Greek, he descended into Hades. There you go. That's part of the Apostles' Creed. And the roots of this creed are found quite early, such as in the writings of Irenaeus. Okay, you with me there? So, Sally, when you learn that as a Lutheran child, pay attention. You are confessing. You're saying, I believe with absolute certainty, with perfect faith, no doubt, he descended into Hades. That's what you're reciting. Did you guys know that? So for all of you that was taught the Apostles' Creed, notice you say, I believe, Latin credo, meaning I believe with absolute certainty, with perfect faith, the following propositions. I have no doubt, and I believe with absolute certainty, there's one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, one Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, the only begotten Son of God. That means you're saying, as part of the faith of the church established by Jesus Christ, I believe that Jesus Christ descended to the netherworld for those three days. And then finish it. Finish it. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, from thence, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Right? Clear? So, do you see this is the ancient faith of the church? Christ, for those three days, descended into the realm of the dead. So now I'm going to show it to you from Scripture. So let me repeat so we can go into the Scripture evidence. Let me repeat. Up until Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, all believers went to the realm of the dead called Hades. And I just showed you from the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, there were two abodes or compartments that were separated by a gulf so they can cross over to one another. One abode, one compartment for, for believers. They're in peace. They're in comfort. 
they're in a state of happiness and bliss. The other, they're in a state of torment. The belief of the church was this, that when Jesus went there, he proclaimed victory over the power of darkness and proclaimed the victory that unbelievers lost out in by their unbelief. And then he went there to take the spirits of the believers back to heaven to dwell now in his presence and the presence of the Father and the holy angels. That's why now when you die as a believer, you don't go to Hades. You go to God's heavenly presence where you behold God the Father in visible glory, Christ in his physical body glorified, and the angels and all other believers. You dwell with the triune God. Now let me show you that in scripture. Are you ready? Acts 2. We're going to pick it up in 24 in midstream. Acts 2, 24 to 28. Let's read. Let me give you the scripture evidence. Acts 2, 24 to 28. Now let me go. Let's go into it. So I had to mention this. So then we go and go Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now, guys, please read with me. Read with me. Luke, the Duke 93, I have no idea what you're talking about, what you're smoking when he says, today you shall be with me in paradise. I don't know how you distinguish God from the person of Jesus. Put down the pipe, son, and listen, and don't pontificate. Acts 2, 24 to 28, read with me. I yeah, know he's going to get ignored if he keeps it up, meaning block. Acts 2, 24 to 28, guys, pay attention and read now. Peter preaching, the first sermon on Pentecost, as he's filled with the Holy Spirit, notice what he says. Whom God hath raised up, God has raised up Jesus, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. So he's going to quote a psalm of David. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. And he says, David is prophesying about Jesus' death and resurrection. So what did David write? What did David say? For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw, I foresaw. I didn't forehear, hear what would happen. I saw in advance what would happen. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he's on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Now watch this. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Why? Because thou will not leave my soul in hell. Notice, my soul in hell. The Greek word is Hades, Hades. Neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me. Thou hast known, made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now watch this. Watch what this is saying. Pay attention. Watch this. Peter says, folks, why are you shocked that Messiah died and was raised from the dead? David, a thousand years in advance, prophesied Messiah, God's Holy One, would be raised from the dead. Where? Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. When David said, my soul was not abandoned in Hades, nor did God allow his Holy One to see corruption, he was talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. Are you with me so far? No, man, it's not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Solomon. Allahu Akbar, Manny. Allahu Akbar. Pins and needles. Needles and pins. A happy man is man that grins. Okay. Are you with me there? David is prophesying a thousand years in advance, that Messiah would die, but he would not be abandoned in the netherworld, but would be raised to life. Okay, you got that part so far. Okay, if you're getting it, now let's show you Peter's inspired interpretation. Don't forget, this is Pentecost. 
He's now filled with the Holy Spirit. He's speaking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit tells Peter, quote this and now explain it. Here's the inspired, Holy Spirit inspired commentary on Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Are we ready now to take it to the next point? Acts 2, 29 to 32. Acts 2, 29 to 32. Acts 2, 29 to 32. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre, his grave, is with us unto this day. We know he's dead. There's his grave. He never came back to life. He died and remained dead. So then what is David talking about? Pick it up at 30. Therefore, being a prophet... Bring a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. God swore to David that from your physical line, I'm going to raise up the Christ from your physical seed, from your physical line. And I'm going to seat him on your throne, David. That's what God promised David. Now watch this. He, David, verse 31. He, David, being a prophet, receiving revelation from the Holy Spirit, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, the soul of Messiah, was not left in hell. Hades, not hell as we know it. Not left in hell. What was not left in hell? His soul. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Notice a distinction. His soul was one place and his flesh was in another place. His soul went to hell and his flesh was buried. But God made sure that the flesh body of Messiah did not corrupt and his soul did not remain in the netherworld because on the third day, his soul came back to his flesh body and was raised to life. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. Did you catch what he just said? When Jesus Messiah died, his soul was in one place and his flesh was in another. So how did God fulfill Psalm 16? By summoning the soul of Messiah, his human soul, his human soul back into his fleshly body. And so when his human soul left Hades, entered that flesh body in the grave, the body came to life, and now Jesus' flesh body became immortal. And then in that flesh body, Jesus went to heaven. That's what you're celebrating this Sunday. That's what you're celebrating this Sunday. You're celebrating that the human soul spirit of Jesus returned to his physical body before it corrupted. And then his physical body became immortal and destructible. And then in that physical body entered heaven and all the souls that were there in Hades were brought out and taken into heaven, meaning the souls of the righteous, the believers. So now they're in heaven with the triune God and angels. That's what you're celebrating if you believe the Bible. I don't. I have no idea what in the world, Alex, you're smoking. Because what do you mean heaven is physical? Son, put down the pipe, son. It's resurrection weekend. Stay away from the bottle. What do you mean physical? What do you mean physical? See, these are the questions that perturb me because I don't. What, what do you mean physical? So wait, Alex, you're telling me that heaven is not capable of allowing a physical body to enter there? Please, Alex, don't disappoint me, man. You were doing good so far. So heaven has to be a physical place for a physical body to dwell there. Really? So heaven can't be a dimension, a dimension of space, place, and time 
That's not identical to the physical earth, but still because it's an actual dimension, an actual place, an actual <clears throat> dimension of time, space, and place that physical bodies can't enter there, then how do angels enter the physical earth? Alex, how do angels who are not physical bodies enter the physical earth? The same way that physical bodies enter a spiritual heaven. No, it's, uh, with me there? So, Alex, let's apply your logic. How do angelic beings who dwell in a spiritual dimension enter into a physical dimension when they're not physical? No, it's okay, Black. I want to help this brother because this brother is a good brother. Alex is a good brother. I know he's, but I'm, I'm toughening him up, shaking him because he presumes to know more about heaven than he does. Who told Alex that heaven cannot allow for physical bodies to dwell there? Not the Bible. The Bible didn't tell him that. So don't presume, and I'm speaking to everyone here. Don't presume. I know you're not, man. Get off your horse, Alex. I'm the only one that can yell at you, bro. This is school time, son. Teacher, I got a rod. I'm from the old time school where we used to beat Kids with rods, sucker, get off that horse. <laughs> All right, but going back to the point and following the point. Okay. Don't presume to know more about heavenly realities than warranted because you know nothing about heaven except what God reveals to you. So if Jesus entered heaven physically, why would you ask, is heaven a physical place just because a physical body entered there? No, heaven is a place and space and time. It is an actual dimension composed of space, place, and time, but it's made of a different type of substance than the physical earth. And angels do have bodies, but not physical bodies from the dust of the earth. Right? And if we're told Jesus went there physically, then why would we assume heaven has to be physical for a physical body to dwell there? It can be a dimension that's not of the same physical stuff of the earth or the universe, but still it's a dimension Composed of time, space, and place. So it is a dimension of place and space. And if it's place and space, that means the beings there that exist there do have shapes and forms, but made of a different type of substance. You with me there? Better question, Sam Baden, Edmund, is do you have a brain cell? Yeah. No, actually, they're more mad that I'm letting a dog like you bark. Get this guy out of here. Get him out of here. No, there's a dog of the devil trying to mock. Get Sam Van Stupid out of here. Uh, Mick, I'll tell you where it says that someone like you is going to be sent. Out of here for asking me that question. Get him out of here too. Mick, Mick Azella, another dog with that name. Get him out of here. All You see now, notice all the dogs of the devil, the filthy dogs of the devil, they're foaming now. You see that? JP Zells, you see that? They're starting to manifest right when we're getting into something deep and beautiful. No, actually, your mother's insane for giving birth to you, not putting you in a doghouse. <laughs> Be Christ-like, Sam. All right, get him out of here. See, they don't know me, homie. I ain't your typical apologist. I'll insult you, sucker. Suck an MC. Call me Zion. No, it's not Jesus' physical body transcends all dimensions. Lord, Lord's K. It's that heaven is a dimension of time, space, and place. So bodies of any kind. Bodies of any and all substances can dwell there because if it's a place, if it, it's composed of space, 
then any bodies, any objects can dwell in it. Which is why angelic creatures can enter the earth and physical beings can enter into heaven. Are you with me there? I, I, I don't know why it's not making sense to you guys. Let me try this again because this took much longer than I thought it would require. But that's okay because I'm trying to help you if it's helping you. Okay. Guys, stop presuming to know what is possible and what's not possible for heaven. You're not God. You haven't been there. You're not an apostle or a prophet. So don't already come to the text assuming what heaven can and cannot be like. That's number one. Okay, let's number two. If heaven is part of creation, and it is, then by its very nature, it is a dimension of space and place. So any space, any place permits objects, bodies of any substance to be able to live in there. See, there goes that filthy dog. Many again. Here again. Yes, Sophie, it's part of creation. To say it's not, then that means you're saying that something other than God is uncreated. Guys, I think I'm gonna close the shop today. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna end the session, guys. I can't handle these questions. Sorry. I think, guys, I think I'm gonna end this session. This has become too much for you guys. Uh, look at the question Remy's asking me: Is heaven above the universe? Dude, this subject's too much. No, honestly, you guys are not able to handle this. I may have gone into a subject I shouldn't have gone into. Thank you, Phil Fox. Yeah, this is kind of too much. <sighs> yeah, this not nah, this too much, man. All right, yeah. yeah. I think I'm going to shut down, guys, because I got to give you guys a break to think about this because you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Thank you, Anonymous Anonymous. You got it, brother. You gave me hope for humanity. Anonymous, anonymous, heaven is not a part of physical universe. What's above the universe? What's above the universe? And why would you talk about up, above? What above? There's up and down with the universe? I mean, man, I'm really, yeah, I'm baffled, man. Okay, Basarad, but Basarad, it's becoming too much for people to handle. It's, it's information overload. I, I'm shocked, honestly. This is why I get angry, honestly. I honestly, I'm gonna go on my one of my spiels again, pet peeves. I cannot believe, I honestly cannot believe, I really cannot believe the level of biblical illiteracy in the West due to churches not doing their job. Okay. What does adopts mean and uh Jewish means? I really cannot. Remy, are you telling me go to sleep? You tell me get lost? Is that what you're telling me, Remy? I really cannot understand the level, the alarming level of biblical ignorance and illiteracy due to churches, due to pastors. Uh, it's it's mind blowing to me why this is hard for people. No, honestly, I'm I'm being honest with you guys. Let me vent because you're my family and I love you guys. I do. I don't love you perfectly because I don't love anyone perfectly because I'm imperfect. Why the alarming rate of biblical illiteracy? Ignorance, man. Wow. And folks, guys, don't think because I'm intelligent and smart, I'm getting it. Let me remind you, okay? Yeah, but Sam, you're we're not like you. Okay, guys. Can I remind you again? Can I encourage you? Can you listen up for a second? Because this took too much time, more than necessary. It's already 84 minutes. Okay, listen. Listen to me, honestly. Folks, I don't have a high school diploma, GED. I haven't been to college or seminary or university. You don't need to be a genius to get this. Trust me, you don't. If so, I wouldn't get it. I'm not a genius. I'm not. I'm not trying to be humble. I'm being honest to God. I don't have a high school diploma, haven't been to college. Remy, get out of here. Don't come back. Now you are a filthy dog. 
you dog for insulting me, pretending to be someone that was my brother. Get him out of here, you stinking dog. Right? Okay. This guy that was here pretending to be a Christian. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a high school diploma. I don't have college, university, seminary. What is my point? You do not need to be a genius or Einstein. He called me an arrogant man and was attacking me, telling me go to sleep because his pride got hurt. The little sissy evangelifish. What you need to do, what you need to do is spend more time prayerfully seeking the face of God and studying the word. And you need to get out of this fast food apologetic theology mentality where I'm only going to listen to something if it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And thank the Lord you, you are doing that. You know, how you, know, you know how I know you're doing that? You know how I know you're doing it? You're here listening to me rant, a, a bald, angry, wicked sinner for two hours. That means you are doing what you need to do to learn. And God will reward you and bless you and give you that wisdom. But it baffles me, what are these pastors doing? What are these pastors doing in their churches? Getting six-figure salaries, many of them. Many of them get six. They're mega churches getting six-figure salaries. Go figure. What are you doing? Why aren't you teaching them the basics? You with me there? I, this is my frustration. I get frustrated and angry. Now, because it's 86 minutes, I won't be able to get into Abraham and Isaac. I'm going to have to change now the title. Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to now change the entire name of the session. It's 86 minutes. I haven't been able to even finish the point where Jesus went. See, now Leah Wiseman, look what she says. I grew up in church and honestly was never taught what you teach. Okay, let me finish this point. Let me see if you're still with me. Let me see if you're still with me, okay? Let me see if you're still with me. When Jesus died physically, his human soul, his human spirit, went to the netherworld called Hades. Up until the point of Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension to heaven, everyone, believer, unbeliever alike, went to the same dimension called Hades, okay? And there were two abodes, two compartments. There was the abode for the righteous, who went there and that same dimension, it's the same dimension, which is why they could see one another. But the righteous went to that part of Hades where they were in a state of peace and bliss and comfort and joy. And there was a gulf separating the other compartment. And in that other compartment are unbelievers who are tormented in agony and misery. So far, are you with me there? You with me there so far? Okay, so we got that, right? Thank the Lord. I want you to get it. I want you to learn this for your, for your benefit, for the glory of Jesus. Okay, what did Jesus do? And I have to finish it because that was part of what he did. Part of what he did was to go down, proclaim that the prophecies have been fulfilled, the redemption has been made, and now it's time for the believers, their souls, to be taken out from Hades completely, and brought into the Father's heavenly presence. That's part of what Jesus did. Did you get that part? So what passage demonstrates that you, Jesus' human soul went there? Acts 2, 24 to 32. What did it say? Jesus' human soul went to Hades. Jesus' human soul went to Hades. Okay. Jesus' human soul went to Hades. His flesh was in the grave. What happened on the third day? Jesus' human soul came out of Hades, entered his flesh body, and he was raised back in that flesh body. But now his flesh body became immortal, 
And in that flesh body, with his human soul, in his flesh body, entered heaven. So far we got that? So far we got that? Now, to answer the other question, heaven is part of creation. And because it's part of creation, it is a dimension of space and place. It's made of a different substance from the earth. It's not the same matter. It's not the same material, same substance, but it's still matter of a different kind. It's still place and space and material, but of a different sort of matter than earthly matter, right? You got that? You got that so far? Okay. Because heaven, like earth, is a dimension of space and place, objects of any material, bodies and shapes of any material, can dwell there and they can dwell here. Did you get that? Did that make sense? How do I know? Because angels come down here, can appear in human form, eat our food, and we can go up there like John in Revelation. Was he not taken up there? Here, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4. Let's see what Paul, what Paul says. 2 Corinthians, yeah, I'm going to have to retitle this. In fact, I wasn't going to teach tomorrow on Resurrection Sunday, but guess what, folks? I'm going to do a Resurrection Sunday message. I'm going to preach on Resurrection Sunday. I wasn't going to do it on Abraham and Isaac because I'm going to have to change the title. I'm going to have to change this session. Okay. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 to 4. I have to because I didn't talk about Abraham and Isaac. I wasn't planning to, but I'm going to in Jesus' name if Jesus wills. Maybe that's what God allowed this to happen. The Lord allowed this to happen so I can preach the message of Abraham and Isaac on Resurrection Sunday. Okay. Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4. Notice what Paul says about a man who was taken to the third heaven, which is the paradise of God. Okay. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 to 4. Watch here. I knew a man in Christ about, about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such and one caught up to the third heaven. Now let's go to verse 4. How that he was caught up into paradise... And he heard unspeakable words, words which is not lawful for a man to utter. So notice, he went to the third heaven, the paradise of God. But now notice verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Now notice what he's saying here. I don't know if he went there in his physical body or his spirit left his body and he went there with his body on earth. But you understand what that's, this implies? He's saying it's either or. He may have went there in the body or he may have not gone there in the body. But that tells you that Paul believes that even in your body, in these sinful bodies, you can enter heaven. Yes, Ariel, it does. If your soul leaves your body and you're still conscious. You understand what this means? He may have been taken there in the body. But wait, Paul. That's a sinful flesh body, decrepit and dying. Yeah, he didn't go there to dwell permanently. He went there temporarily and came back. But I thought it's heaven. How do physical bodies enter? Is it making sense now? No, Mr. Phil, my brother. This is why I'm saying, help me to help you, don't help me. Enoch and Elijah did not enter heaven with their physical bodies. Nobody went to heaven. Mr. Phil... You just heard me say that up until the time of Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, nobody went to the abode of God. They went to Hades. That's Enoch and Elijah as well. Those passages are misunderstood and misinterpreted to say what they do not say. I don't have time to explain it now. So is it making sense now? Yeah, too many, too much, too much, too much. Now, does that answer that heaven is a dimension of space and place and that objects of any shape, of any substance can enter there? Because once it's a dimension of space and place, 
then material objects of any substance of any matter can enter there. Right? Clear? See, we're losing people. We were 81, 85. People are like, I got to bail out. See, I told you it's too complicated. People are losing. We're losing people. We're in from 85. They're like, man, this is too much. Now, someone told me, is heaven created? Yep. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. Nehemiah 9, verse 6. You got these poor teachers and evangelists and apologists who barely survive because they're in full-time ministry, who are teaching you the meat of God's word. And yet you got these mega pastors who are teaching garbage and they get six figure salaries. Okay. Now, Maya chapter nine, verse six, read with me. Now, Maya chapter nine, verse six, thou, even thou art Lord, pay attention now, is heaven where angels dwell created? Okay, here. Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou preservest them all, and the host of heaven worshipeth thee. The host refer to angels. Did you catch it? God made all of the heavens. Paul said there are three heavens. He made all three, even the heaven where the host live, where the angels live. Is it clear that even the heaven where angels dwell is created? He made it. He sustains it. It's created. Is it clear? God bless you too. Yep. Peter Jerai, let me repeat what he just said. The only thing uncreated is the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And they don't need space. They don't need place. They don't need to exist in time. Are you aware that even in the heavens and earth, the new heavens and the new earth, are you aware that in the new heavens, new earth, the new heavens, new earth is still part of creation? It's still bound to time, space, and place? That even in the new earth, you're going to continue to experience time? Are you aware of this? Do you want me to give you proof for that? Do you want me to give you the passage for that? New heaven, new earth? After the judgment, the resurrection, people are thrown into hell. New Jerusalem comes down to the earth. God comes to dwell on earth with Jesus, his son, with the Holy Spirit. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. Manny Flores, not only is the Godhead outside of creation, the Godhead can enter creation and manifest their presence visibly for you to see. Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. No, after the thousand years, after the resurrection of the dead, after unbelievers are sent to hell and Satan is sent there, after heavenly Jerusalem comes down and God the Father comes down to dwell with his son on earth with the spirit in a new heaven, new earth, where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more death. Here, Revelation 22, verses 1 to 3. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, in the midst of the tree, street of it, and either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. Every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and a servant shall serve him. Wait, every month? There are still months? And days in the new heaven, new earth? Revelation 22, 2. Post it again. Revelation 22, 2. In the midst of the street... Of it, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. This is the new heaven, new earth, no more death, no more pain, no more disease. And there's still time. 
time. And another question for the brother who asked me. I don't know if he left. Notice it says, Heavenly Jerusalem, the Jerusalem that's above, will come to the earth. How can Heavenly Jerusalem now be on earth if Heavenly Jerusalem it's, is not a dimension of space and place that's compatible with earth? Not so much physical, meaning Jesus Christ is the Lord. It's not part of this physical substance. It's not part of this physical matter. It is physical in the sense of that it's still a dimension. It still is matter, space, place, and time. So angels have a material shape and form, but it's not a material body composed of physical stuff. Of the earth, the dust of the earth. You get my point now? That's okay, Azul. Whatever it says, it's still month, right? It's still month, Azul. There's still months. Right? Exactly, Jot Inc. Let me repeat what Jot Inc. said. God bless you. Earth, heaven, and hell are all created, and those who dwell in them are given bodies fit to dwell within. Thank you. Okay. Do you want further proof, further proof, that spiritual bodies, angelic bodies, are similar to human bodies and the fleshly bodies of the earth, but not identical? Not identical? Can I give you further proof? Man, this, this conversation went a different direction. It went a different direction. You want further proof? Okay. Matthew 10, 28. Those in hell and the lake of fire, they'll be sent there with their bodies and souls intact. Matthew 10, 28. Matthew 10, 28. Okay. Now read this. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both the soul and body. Now notice, hell, the lake of fire, the second death, everlasting fire, is where the body and soul together are thrown in, right? Your physical body with your human soul, right? Notice again the distinction. The soul is not the body. The body is not the soul. Your human soul is distinct from your physical body. So someone can kill your physical body, but not touch your human soul. But God will take your human soul and physical body together and throw it in hell, right? You just saw that, right? You just saw that, right? Before I move on? Okay, now, Matthew 25, 41. Explain this to me. Matthew 25, 41. Exactly, Bill Thompson. God bless you. Matthew 25, 41. Watch here, guys. Now pay attention now. Let's see if you're catching it, Luis, and everyone else. Then shall he, the Lord Jesus, say to those on his left, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Wait. The same everlasting fire that human beings will be thrown in with bodies and souls is the same fire that will torment the devil and angels who don't have physical bodies like you. How can the same fire... Torment both types of creatures. The devil and angels that don't have physical bodies like you made of the earth. And then human beings with physical bodies and human souls. How's that possible? So when someone tells me, wait, is heaven physical? for No, why does it have to be physical like the earth? Meaning of the same material substance of the earth. Angels do not have physical bodies from the earth. They have bodies of a different kind, of a different substance, but they are still similar enough and compatible enough, right, that they can do human functions and we can do angelic functions, right? Angels can do what humans do and humans can do what angels do to a certain extent. What are you talking about, new bodies, man? I'm asking fools. What? La, 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 la. The human body of the unbeliever is resurrected. It's still that human body. 
united to the human soul and thrown into the everlasting fire. The only difference with their human body is it cannot deteriorate. So it's only new in the sense that now it doesn't, if you believe hell is forever. It's another topic. Okay. Everyone got this? Man, it fried me out. Whew. It took a lot out of me. I didn't even get to talking about Jesus uh, in depth. All right. Who, anyone confused still? Someone is asking me, is it okay if Medic Christ is unblocked? I guess this person doesn't know that Medic for Christ is Christos Anesti, one of our mods. Protestant believer, you still don't know who Christos Anesti is? He's Medic for Christ. He's one of our mods. He's wondering if it's okay to unblock Medic for Christ. All right. Anyone confused? <laughs> What about 1 Corinthians 15, Manny Flores? You're going to now make this another two-hour session for me to explain 1 Corinthians 15, what it means and what it doesn't mean? Because you brought it up earlier and you misapplied it. What about 1 Corinthians 15? You know, 1 Corinthians 15 has nothing to do with angelic bodies. It has to do with the resurrected body being spiritual, not in the sense it's not a physical body, in the sense that it is a body under the power, dominion of the Holy Spirit, as opposed to under the power and dominion of sin and corruption and decay. You're misreading spiritual body. You're misunderstanding the term spiritual body. I think I had to do a session on 1 Corinthians 15. You see, I get people angry. My frustration, impatience, and my sinfulness, I get people angry. And they attack me, call me a jerk and arrogant, and never want to see my face. Can I get maybe on my license in real estate and retire somewhere, become a millionaire, selling home, and maybe I can go buy something in Hawaii and disappear, and no one will ever see me again. So I won't cause people to stumble. I think that would be better. Okay. I'm scared to proceed because all these things are coming up. He keeps quoting 1 Corinthians 15, and I keep telling him, you're misquoting it. You don't understand what it's saying. It's not saying the bodies are not physical. Okay, now, with that said, are we all on the same page? No one's confused with the material so far? You got all this? See, I, see, I lost one already. You got all this? But David, he keeps going up. I keep going down. All right. So are we at least clear that Jesus went to Hades? Are we clear on that, Luis and everyone else? Are we clear? All right. You sure we're clear? All right. Now, let me give you further proof that when Jesus died, his human soul, his human spirit went to the netherworld. Can I give you further proof? Luke 8.31. Luke 8.31. Luke 8.31. Let me show you something here. Let me show you this. Yeah, I got to do, I'm going to have to change the name of this session tomorrow. If you guys want me to, Easter Sunday, which I wasn't going to teach, if the Lord Jesus permits if the Lord Jesus is pleased, tomorrow I'm going to do a Resurrection Sunday message on Abraham and Isaac being a picture of Christ. Because, look, it's already 100 minutes, and I didn't even get to the topic. Luke 8, 31, I want you to see what the de demoniacs, the legions, say to the Lord Jesus. Luke 8, 31. Bobby, brother, let me repeat myself what I've said in the previous session, because you just distracted me, Bobby T., I leave the comment section so I can interact with people to make sure they're getting it. So if they're confused, I can help them. So there's a benefit and a curse in allowing comment section. The benefit is that I can see they got it and now understand it, and they can now teach it to others. 
The curse is I get distractions like you telling me turn off the comment section. So I waste time on correcting you why I don't turn off the comment section. But thank you, Bobby. All right. Alex, brother. Can you show me, Alex, in 1 Corinthians 15 that those in Christ are given heavenly bodies? Is that what you're referring to there? Because we're talking about him as supplying what spiritual body means, and you mentioned this, Alex. Hold on, guys. Too, this was too bad today. This is really bad. What does heavenly bodies have to do with the spiritual bodies that the brother kept misapplying to refer to the fact that when we die, we have spiritual bodies, not physical ones? What does that have to do? And if I want you to show me, Alex, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says the believers, their bodies are heavenly, right? No, you won't, Alex. Alex, I'm going to give you a chance to show me where it says our bodies are called heavenly. I'm going to give you a minute to show me. Quote the verse where it says, the believers, their bodies are heavenly bodies as opposed to being spiritual. Yeah, exactly, Jake. You know where I'm going with this. Go ahead, Alex. Because you, 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 you won't stop pontificating. Okay, send Alex out of here. Bye-bye, Alex. God bless you. Thank you for your support. Find another channel. You need to get out of here. Okay? Got to take care, buddy. He needs to go. Guys, quick. Come on. Thank you. Okay. All right, now. Let me remind you guys. Don't come to my channel, Pontificate. If you already know, go somewhere else. You're not here to learn. Okay? Because now I'm going to spend another hour explaining what 1 Corinthians 15 means and doesn't mean. And then they're going to call me arrogant. Right? They're going to say, you're arrogant, Sam. Yeah, I know. I'm very arrogant. I am so arrogant that I make David Wood look humble. All right. Now, with that said, are we ready now to take it to the next phase? No, he wasn't. And Ike, he wasn't. Okay. Are we ready now to take it to the next phase? Without distractions, without any distractions. You sure? You positive? Because I'm scared now. You guys have scared me. And then people are going to say, say, man, this guy's a jerk. That's why no one wants. Yeah, I get that. I, man, I hear it every day. I got someone saying, you're a jerk. You're nasty. I don't see Jesus in you. I don't need this, honestly. I'll be honest with you. I don't need to do this because I'm sick and tired of people calling me a jerk and nasty and arrogant. I'm tired of it, man. I don't want this, but I'm not going to allow chaos and confusion in my channel. I want to maintain order so that people don't get confused. But I'm not here to be belittled by people. You're a jerk. You're arrogant. I don't see Christ in you. Yeah? Tough luck. I'm going to lose sleep. Woo! Come on. Whew. And then I got David Wood on my case. See, Sam, that's why you're not going, you're blowing up because you block people and you're an arrogant jerk, Sam. You're Rain Man. All right. Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. Luke 8 31. Luke 8 31. Luke 8 31. Thank you, 19th October. I appreciate it. I have nose hairs, but no hair. Okay, now read what the demoniacs say to Jesus. Read what the demoniacs say to Jesus. And they besought him that he would not command them to go in, out into the deep. Now, guys, I'm going to give you the link here. Okay. I'm going to give you the link here. I want you to go look at the interlinear and tell me what the word deep means. Okay. Tell me what the word deep means. Exactly, Johnny. Go somewhere else. Honestly, I won't lose sleep. Go somewhere else. Okay, Luke 8, 31. Can you go click on that and tell me what the word deep is in the Greek? You know what it is? 
It's abuso. The root is abuso. Okay? Abuso. You know what that is? That's the abyss, also called the bottomless pit. Okay, guys, are you seeing what the demons are telling Jesus? Don't send us to the abuso, the abyss, the bottomless pit. Thank you, Mickey. God bless you, brother. May the Lord Jesus shine his face on you and everyone who sincerely loves Jesus and want to follow him. Okay, are you seeing this? Did you guys see what Luke 8.31 is saying? Did you confirm? Because I can't move on. We're going to be here, and we're going to cut into the debate time of Anthony Rogers. I want to watch the debate. If you click on it, you're going to see it says, do not send us into the abuso, the bottomless pit. This is the word, bottomless pit, right? The abyss. It's in the accusative in the Greek, abusan. Forget that it's in the accusative. When you see the new, it means accusative. I don't have time for grammar. It's abuso, the abyss. Okay. What is the abyss? What's the bottomless pit? If you look at Revelation chapter 9, we're not going to look at all of it. Revelation chapter 9. Please focus so I know that you're learning and I'm helping you for the glory of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Revelation 9 says that a star fell from heaven and he was given the keys to the abuso, the bottomless pit. The abuso, the bottomless pit. Right? And he opened it up and demons came out of it. Demons came out of it. They came out of what? The abuso, the abyss, the bottomless pit. Okay. Now, let me show you. He just posted Revelation 9, 11, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit. Now, let's see what the word for bottomless pit is. Okay. Here it is. Revelation 9, 11. Here you go. You see it, right? Black Smurf, you're going to see where I'm going to go with this. If you go there, click on it. Look at what the word bottomless pit is. It's the same Greek word. It's abuso, but it's in the accusative of the abuso, right? Of the abyss, the bottomless pit. You're going to see where I'm going to go with this. So do you see, if you read Revelation 9, this bottomless pit, this deep, this abyss that the demons didn't want to go to, that's where demons are sent and are confined. So what will God do before the return of Christ? He'll command a star, an angel, to open up the bottomless pit and unleash demons to torment and torture mankind on earth for five months. With me there? Now, why is the bottomless pit, the abyss, important? Because that's where Satan will be bound for a thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Pay attention to verse 2. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. Okay. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit. What's the bottomless pit? A buso, abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan bound him a thousand years. Where? And cast him, verse 3, into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he would... Must be loose a little season. So Satan will be bound in the abuso, the abyss, the bottomless pit, the deep, where the demons did not want to go and beg Jesus that he wouldn't send them there. Okay, now let me prove it to you. Here you go. Tell me again what the word is in Greek. Here you go. Don't take my word for it. Click there. What is the word bottomless pit in the Greek? The word deep in the Greek, the abyss, the bottomless pit. It's the same place, right? Of course they don't like it, Pistol. It's, it's, they're there to be tormented. They're there in prison and confined and tortured. So did everyone confirm, all 180 of you, 
The word deep in Luke 8, 31 is the same word we're using Revelation 9 and Revelation 20 to refer to that abode called the bottomless pit, the abyss, where demons and Satan are confined and bound. Everyone confirm this? Okay. Everyone confirm it? Luisa, Magdalene, Zena, if you're here. All right. You know why? Because now you're going to get blown away. Are you ready to get blown away? Something I am I guarantee you, you have not heard in any of your churches. Tell me if I'm right. Romans 10, verses 6 to 7. Romans 10, verses 6 to 7. Get ready to be blown away. Romans 10, verses 6 to 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Bam! Jesus went to the abyss for those three days. Guess what the word deep is? Abyss. Your Lord, my Lord, descended to the bottomless pit, according to Romans 10, verse 7. Let me give you the Greek. Let me give you the Greek. Here it goes. Click on it. Tell me if the word deep is abyss. Jesus Christ, when his body was in the tomb... Those three days, his human soul, his human spirit, went to the abyss where demons are confined and tormented. Now, he didn't go there to be tormented. That's blasphemy. He didn't go there to be tortured. He went there to proclaim himself as the king over the powers of darkness and proclaim victory for those human spirits waiting in Abraham's bosom. He went there as victor to proclaim the victory of the saints of God that he wrought by his death. So the early church got it right. Jesus descended into Hades. But he did not go there to be tormented. He went there as victor. As conquering king, proclaiming to the demons, you have been defeated. Not only because you've been confined, but because I have wrought the victory that will overthrow your master and the kingdom of darkness. And he went to empty out Abraham's bosom and take them into heaven to dwell with him in glory. How about it, 19th October? You're challenging me? You want to get blocked? Tell me you're challenging me, October 19th. Make my day. What do you mean you struggle with your pastor? No, that's blasphemy, Bobby. He wasn't tormented. Okay. So... Let's go to Revelation 1, 17, 18 to see that Jesus went there as victor, not victim. He went there as conqueror, not conquered. He went there as victor, not victim. He went there as conqueror, not conquered. Revelation 1, 17, 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first last, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell, the word is Hades, and of death. I conquered Hades and death, and they're in my hand, they're under my control, under my authority. He went there as victor, not victim. He went there as conqueror, not conquered. Thank you, Mendez. God bless you.
Did you catch it? So let me repeat it again. He went there as victor. No, you don't need to delete their comments, Riaz. If she's quoting scriptures and glorifying Jesus, let them glorify God. That's what the channel's for. He went there as victor, not victim. He went there as conqueror, not as one conquered. That means when the denizens of Abyss saw, saw him, they trembled with fear and horror. The one who will torment us is here. Why? Not for you. But for those in Abraham's bosom, sons, daughters of the living God, time to come home. Your victory has been accomplished. Your redemption has drawn nigh. Let's go. And they went. Right? That's why I want you to read today on your own time because we can't read it right now and I got to end. I can't read it right now, so you got to read it at your own leisure. I want you to read Revelation, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, right? Read it all the way through. You know why I want you to read it all the way through? Can I tell you why? Why do I want you to read Hebrews 11 all the way through? Does anyone have an idea? Because it mentions all the major Old Testament saints. It mentions Abraham. In fact, it mentions Noah and Enoch and Abel and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Samson and all of Moses. It mentions all the Old Testament saints, right? All the major characters, right? And it says they died without entering the heavenly city. They were not allowed to enter the heavenly city until the time of perfection came. Okay, so it's talking about them by faith, eagerly wanting to enter into the heavenly city, heavenly Jerusalem, but they could not enter because they had to wait for our perfecting, meaning Jesus, to come and perfect us by his life, death, and resurrection, right? That's what it says. But you got to read it. Because now that the perfect has come, now that the, the redemption has been accomplished, now that Jesus has perfected us by his sacrifice and entered heaven, entered heaven, where are they now? Where are they now? Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Let's, let's read and pay attention. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly one. So you're coming to heaven. You're entering heaven, you by faith in Christ. And in heaven, who's there? Innumerable company, company of angels. They're there in heavenly Jerusalem. Who's there? To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Those who are having church in heaven. There's church in heaven. Who's also there? God is there, the Father, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Wow. The spirits of believers who have died in Christ, perfected in Christ, their human spirits are there in church with angels before God the Father. And who else is there? Verse 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Yep, soul sleep, the ideology put to sleep. Did you catch it? So who's in heavenly Jerusalem? God the Father, innumerable angels, and the church of redeemed believers, redeemed by Christ, which includes the spirits of the men. Notice not their bodies. Their bodies are not there. Their spirits are there, now perfected, because Jesus is there who perfected them, by offering his sacrifice to the Father to allow them now to enter into God's heavenly presence. Jesus is there in his glorified physical body. They are there too, Peter. They're there too. That's why now after Christ, when you die, now after Christ, when you die, you go to heaven, you don't go to Hades. Hades is now the abode of the damned. There is no abode or compartment in Hades for believers anymore. That's good, Charbel. They're right. The Catholic Church is right there to teach that, 100%.
So this entire two-hour session was all about where Jesus went. So we need to retitle this. Guys, mods, retitle this. You sure you want me to come on tomorrow, God willing, and do a sermon on Abraham and Isaac as a picture of Christ and the cross? Because it's Resurrection Sunday. How many of you guys will be here? Because I want 200 tomorrow then. Then promise me we're going to be over 200 by the grace of God. We're up to 185 today. You sure? Okay. God willing then, tomorrow, between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time, between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, God willing, I'm going to do Abraham Isaac as a picture of Jesus Christ and the cross. God willing. Because this entire session had nothing to do with Abraham Isaac. We're going to have to retitle it right when it's done. And Lord Jesus willing, within 50 minutes, Anthony Rogers will be debating Andrew Griffin on whether the Gospel of John teaches the deity of Christ for David Wood's hater channel, hater Wood's channel. So go there because Anthony Rogers is a beast. By the grace of Jesus, he will expose Andrew Griffin like I did, who wants to continually blaspheme God. By robbing Jesus of his glory, he's not learning his lesson. May the Lord silence him and shame him and humble him because he keeps blaspheming Jesus no matter how many times he's refuted. So go there, support Anthony, pray for him. He's a theological beast. And Lord Jesus willing, tomorrow, Lord willing, at between 5 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will join you on the topic, Abraham and Isaac, a picture of the Father and the Son and their love for us as displayed on the cross of Calvary, if the Lord Jesus wills. Pray for my daughters and I that this Easter Sunday, a miracle will happen. My daughters and I will be reunited, a resurrection of my family to see them. I have not heard from them, but Jesus loves them more than I can imagine. And guys, thank you for your financial support. I couldn't do it without you. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for loving me for the sake of Jesus. As long as the Lord gives me health and holiness, to teach, I will teach. But he doesn't need me. We need him. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Son of God. Wash us in your blood. Seal us by your love. Fill us with your spirit to be in love with you, Lord Jesus, and our families. My daughters, do a miracle for their sake, Lord Jesus. You are risen and alive, and you can never die. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, in Jesus' name. Take care.